very much. Well, I could never live up to that introduction, and so I'm not even going to try. I'm, I'm a little bit worried that there's like a proposal review request coming my way, or, or some, something is coming from Alex here. But, but it, I, I really appreciate it, Alex. This is very nice of you. Um, I, I'm incredibly honored to, to win this award, uh, uh, not only because I don't think I deserve it. <laughs> it's an incredible uh, honor from this group and recognition that I, uh, I'm very pleased to see, uh, but also because it's named after Norman Bowen, who, of course, was at my own institution. Uh, and left a fairly vivid memory in my education. And as I remember, one of the first books that I bought while I was a student at UCSD was, was uh, Evolution of Igneous Rocks. And, you know, even, I, I assume it's still a, a standard uh, book, in, a textbook in the uh, universities. But if you look at that, you know, it's, it's such a clear and, and uh, uh, compelling presentation of a very important geological problem, basically the compositional, what's controlling compositional evolution of igneous rocks. And it's such an easy read that even an undergraduate can get it. And then you think, you know, the fundamental contribution that that made and that was written in 1928 really thinks, uh, you know, shows you that this guy was, was uh, on top of the field. Um, I have no hope whatsoever of living up to that reputation. So um, uh, what I'll do today is a little bit uh, uh, more subdued than that. When I got the uh, announcement from Alex that I'd won this award, I, I was, of course, overjoyed. And when the, that uh, excitement died down, I began to want, worry that maybe I got confused with one of the other many Richard Carlsons that are members of, of the AGU. So, so I started to wonder, you know, what, what did I actually get this award for? So I went and I, I uh, looked at my top ten cited papers, and uh, of those, it turns out that only four of them are first authored by me. And of those four, only, only three, of them, or three of them are on the Western United States. So that led me to the conclusion that I began with this award because I work well with other people. Uh, so I'm going to change, the, actually, the subject in my talk from this one, which is in the abstract, to, to this one. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about a project that we have ongoing now that uh, you know, describes this ability to work with people. It's a multidisciplinary, multi-institutional, multi-investigator study of the causes of interplate uh, volcanism. Uh, this is a long-term love of mine uh, starting out uh, working in uh, flood basalts in the western U.S. Uh, and this has uh, finally allowed me to come back together with a, a variety of techniques, not just uh, volcanology, geochemistry, and petrology, which are components of this um, but also including uh, seismology and genomic modeling of it. This work is being undertaken with a number of people. You see them here, uh, a number of principal investigators, and I'm uh, going to be doing what is now becoming a more standard role of being the, just the uh, pr uh, promoter and, and uh, presenter of a lot of uh, important work being done by these people. So you see here's the petrology of chemistry component getting ready to fall off the cliff at Steens Mountain. Uh, the passive seismology, these guys work in any conditions. Uh, you know, this is supposed to be the deserts of eastern Oregon, and here it's a nice snowstorm. Uh, here's drilling for an active seismic component and the group of people that were involved in it. Why is this an important area to do this type of study? Uh, well, the uh, volcanic record in this area really is truly a standout in the world. Uh, this is a map uh, from Lutke and Smith from 1984 uh, that shows you the extent of volcanism in the, in the Pacific Northwest. These are, rocks are all younger than, I, I think it's an 18, 17 million year old cutoff here. Uh, you can see many uh, aspects of volcanism. There's the flood basalt promises here in the Columbia River basalts and also down here in Steens Mountain. There's the Cascade Convergent Margin activity out here, and there's the Snake River Plain uh, hotspot trace here. So there's tremendous uh, volumes of volcanism in this area. There's uh, many types. There's many petrogenetic causes for this volcanism. So it's a great place to go and, and try to unravel what's really leading to this, this very large volume of volcanism. The area we're going to be concentrating on here is this high lava plains, which is basically most of eastern Oregon. It's an area at about 100,000 square kilometers of surface area. And the only rocks exposed at the surface are, are mid uh, to late Cenozoic uh, volcanic rocks. So it's basically a completely uh, volcanic uh, covered area uh, of very young volcanism. Uh, and there's very interesting features of this. Is one is that it basically disobeys all of what we know about what should be causing volcanism in an inter interplate setting. There's, of course, uh, correlations between volcanism and extensional terrains. This is an extensional terrain. You see here the outline in, in the gray is the basin and range area. This uh, high lava plains is the northern part of the basin and range, and there are extensional structures, but it turns out that it's an area that's extending very slowly. So it uh, definitely doesn't have the degree of extension like down here in cent the central basin and range in Nevada. It's got small amounts of extension, and today it's, it's barely uh, extending at all, yet you see that it's got this tremendous volcanic uh, surge across here. There are other aspects. You have this hot spot trace here, but then you have this very large volume of volcanism in the flood basalts that are often associated with, with plume arrivals, for example, if, if you assign this to a plume. But these are well displaced from the, the starting locality of the Snake River Plain, which is somewhere down here. The eruptive centers of the Columbia River, River basalts actually are up in this area. 
So the other thing on this feature is that what you've got here is a, a volcanism that's sampling many different lithospheric terrains in North America. So this black line is the 706 line, and you'll see in uh, a few slides uh, the significance of that line. It's basically marking the boundary between a variety of, of young, uh, mostly Cenozoic and Mesozoic accreted terrains off the west coast here with what is Precambrian North America, even to ages of uh, sort of three billion years or more in, in central Idaho here. So, so this is really a fundamental continental boundary, and you can see that the volcanology really doesn't care about it very much at all. We will see compositional controls over particularly isotopic uh, changes that occur across that, but you see the volcanism occurs on basically on both sides of it. Okay, so what really is causing all this volcanism? The debate uh, is sort of, uh, oh, it, it, it's run into this, this problem that there's two end members that are very clearly expressed in different parts of the provinces, but neither one of them are very clearly shown in the high lava plains itself. If you move to the west, you have what's clearly convergent margin volcanism. I don't think anybody would argue about that out here in the Cascades. These have all the, the chemical isotopic uh, signatures that you would expect of it. They have these nice central strato volcanoes, the typical, you know, the, textbook image of a convergent margin. Uh, that's certainly what these are. So various people have tried to extend this activity into the back arc, me, me meaning being among them. Uh, and we'll be looking at areas, in particular Newberry is a, a very interesting case because it's uh, usually assigned to the high lava plains activity, but we'll look at a lot of the composition uh, there and work I'm doing with, with Tim Grove and Julie Donnelly Nolan. Uh, the other end member, though, is out here, uh, the Snake River Plain. And the common explanation for that is the Yellowstone Plume. And there's many features of, of this uh, volcanism that are consistent with a plume type of activity. Uh, there's a time progressive volcanism. It starts down here at about 16, uh, 16 and a half million years and has moved up to present day volcanism uh, up here in Yellowstone. Uh, there's the large volume volcanism. If you start this out with the flood basalts, for example, you had uh, on the order of two to 300,000 cubic kilometers of, of basalt come out in a very short time period. So the typical example of a flood basalt followed by this uh, time progressive trace of volcanism moving up in, in this direction. Uh, the Snake River Plain basalts have at least one uh, chemical or isotopic signal uh, associated with oceanic hotspots, and that's high helium-3-4 ratios, uh, generally above 10, often up to, to 15 or so. Work particularly uh, recently from Dave Graham and, and colleagues. Uh, so these are a characteristic associated with oceanic uh, plumes, but it turns out that's the only uh, chemical and isotopic characteristic of these rocks that uh, seems plume-like. But then there's a series of, of geophysical features of it that are easily explained in some sort of a plume model as well. There's a topographic swell around the front of it. There's a positive gravity anomalies. There's a, a seismic halo around, around the Yellowstone area. So all these features combined, they're basically the expectations one have for plume models. So if you move this uh, to the high lava plains, then can you ask how many of these plume characteristics actually uh, extend in the high lava plains? The answer is basically none of them. Uh, none of these geophysical phenomena occur uh, in the high lava plains. Uh, the high lava plains, again based on Dave Graham's work, has uh, helium-3-4 ratios that are fairly similar to the mid-ocean ridge basalts. Uh, the vol volcanism in the high lava plains, if you exclude the uh, flood basalts, the uh, post-flood basalt volcanism here is relatively small in volume. It's maybe an order of magnitude or so in very rough numbers, less than what you see in the Snake River Plain. Uh, but there is a time progressive volcanic trace across the high lava plains, which is uh, sort of lingered as an uh, ex explanation for why this is related to, to plume activity. Uh, this uh, really was defined most recently in work by uh, Anita Grunder and her students. This is a paper from Brennan Jordan in particular. Uh, what's uh, a characteristic of both the Snake River Plain and the High Lava Plains is that the time progressive volcanism really is defined by the silicic activity, not so much by the basaltic activity. So here you see a map that just shows the silicic activity. This is this area of central Oregon. This is the High Lava Plains by definition. And you see here isochrons of silicic rocks of various age uh, moving out from a starting, at least in this area, around 10 million years, going out to uh, the uh, Current activity here in, New in Newberry, this is only thousands of years old uh, obsidian domes here. Um, so the you know, conventional wisdom is that this is a time progressive trace, but the trouble with attributing it to a hot spot is that the plate motion is the direction shown by the Snake River Plain, which is to the northeast here, and this is progressive to the northwest. So it's running at about 90 degrees to plate motion, which is certainly not what you'd expect if this is a, you know, a fixed uh, position in the mantle and the North America is just riding over it. The other aspect of this, though, that, that's hard to reconcile with a hotspot trace 
is that if you look at the basaltic compositions down here, uh, you see that there really is no time progressive activity. There are many areas across the high lava plains where there's been volcanism more or less continuously for the last 15 million years. You can pick an area like this down here, Diamond Craters. Diamond Craters, uh, it's a National Historical Monument. Uh, it, it only, it's, gee, it's only like a, probably a 20 hour drive from here. You should go see it if you have some time during the meeting. It's a beautiful area of young volcanism, uh, uh, but it's surrounded it, it, by other uh, basaltic shields that range in age from uh, hundreds of thousands to millions to seven million to 15 million. So it's pretty much uh, been sporadically active throughout the whole history of the high lava plains, and that's true of many of these centers here. Okay, what are uh, uh, types of, of volcanic rocks are being erupted in this area? We'll look at some very general characteristics here, just a total alkali silica diagram. Uh, this shows one of the beauties and curses of databases. One of the, the uh, things I've luckily been in, involved with is the compilation of the NAVDAT database, where I've done very little, but I, I've gotten to uh, have the joy of working with the people that do combine it, uh, is to get these kind of data sets for, for the Western US. Uh, so you see in comparison here, the, uh, I've plotted Hawaii, which are in the blue crosses. Just to give you an example, of a, it's a nearby oceanic hotspot. If you want to believe that Plume is responsible for it, it's you know, one of many, but it's a, at least a possible uh, uh, type of rock to compare with. And then there's also uh, Juan de Fuca uh, mid-ocean ridge basalts that are plotted in here that you'll basically never see in these diagrams because they lie underneath the, the high lava plains uh, basalts. These are very similar. Uh, they're not quite the same as mid-ocean ridge basalts in major element composition, but they're very similar, and they're not going to be distinguished on these type of diagrams. Uh, the majority of the high lava plains, especially the older stuff, uh, is this, these uh, more evolved basaltic rocks. You see there's a very strong bimodality to it. There's mainly basalts on the high lava plains, and then there's silicic components, so there's this big gap in composition, so it's a traditional bimodal basalt rhyolite field. This is in strong contrast to the cascades here, which are shown in these green squares. I hope I'm pointing the right thing. I, I can just barely see the screen from here, but it, uh, the uh, plot in this range, and these uh, show a much wider range of compositions, including uh, many intermediate rocks, andesites, of course, and, and uh, onto day sites, basaltic andesite, where you have this more basalt and, and rhyolite clustering in the high lava plains. A figure that's more petrogenetically interesting is, is looking at something like the iron versus magnesium plot here, because this really pulls out what, again, are sort of Bowenesque. Uh, traditional differentiation patterns in, in uh, basalts, the tholytic trends and the calc alkaline trend. Tholytic trend, of course, is defined by as, one, as the magnesium drops, the iron uh, enriches. Uh, so this is the classic iron enrichment trend. That is the characteristic of the flood basalt area, and you see that most of the high lava plains, uh, lavas go up in that uh, region. That's distinguished here from the cascades, which are down here, that show decreasing iron with uh, decreasing magnesium, a more or less typical sign of calc alkaline differentiation, usually associated with wet melts uh, and with convergent margin melts. So what I've done in these figures is the bigger symbols and the more vivid colors are a select group of samples that were selected because they represent near primary melts out of the mantle. They have very high magnesium concentrations. Of course, a lot of the variation on these diagrams rep represents fractional crystallization. So I've selected out these that represent uh, perhaps mantle components. You see on this diagram is that many of these uh, plot into this general region. So this, uh, there's the, Juan de, the probably the only Juan de Fuca Moore point you'll see on this diagram. So they're looking like normal uh, high aluminum olivine tholeites uh, that you would find in, in an extensional setting, particularly like a, a mid-ocean ridge basalt for shallow, shallow melting of, of uh, peridotitic mantle. Uh, some of them show more iron enrichment, just approaching the, the characteristics you see in Hawaii. But particularly at Newberry here, you see these very low iron concentrations, which are, are you know, a signature of the calc alkaline trend. And we'll see this in many slides, is that there's this bimodality at Newberry between a very strong calc alkaline signature, which links it to the cascade uh, uh, margin, and also these uh, more high lava plains-ish uh, iron enriched tholytic trends. We'll see this in a number of tracers of subduction components as we go on. Uh, the, I mentioned that there's uh, the 706 line. Uh, you know, people that work in the Western U.S., that's all you have to say, and they know instantly what it is. You talk to people that don't work in the Western U.S., and they look at you like, what are you talking about? Uh, this is what we're talking about. This is a plot of longitude versus 87, 86 strontium in a longer diagram. You see here in the western part, this is the high lava plains and the cascades uh, as well. As soon as you reach about the Oregon-Idaho border here, 
uh, you see there's this very dramatic increase in 87, 86 strontium. And what's plotted on this diagram is not just basalt. So these are both basalts and silicic rocks. In the western part, you always have low strontium. In the eastern part, you always have high strontium, uh, even in the basaltic rocks here. And you start seeing this very strong separation between the silicic rocks, which have very, very high uh, 87, 86, compared to the basaltic rocks. But even in the basalts, you're talking about numbers of 0.707 or so. Uh, if you move to the west, uh, you don't really see that separation. So these blue diamonds are silicic rocks from the high lava plains. And you see there is definitely this tendency to rise as you get towards the 706 line, which is right here. But in the high lava plains itself, both the primitive lavas, the fractionated lavas, and the silicic rocks all have uh, 87, 86 strontium values of about 0.704 or so. So this is a signature. This is probably the only strong signature that these are very strongly interacting with lithos lithosphere. So these are seeing Precambrian North America over here. Uh, these maybe are not seeing the lithosphere, or alternatively, the, the uh, primitive accreted terrains that they're erupting through simply don't have uh, evolved isotopic compositions that would cause these, these uh, values to rise off of this line. The other important feature about uh, these magmas is that they do change in composition with time. So this is a, a simple plot of magnesium versus silica. Uh, the black symbols here are uh, uh, high lava plains basalts. This is uh, segregated. I think I cut it at 4% magnesium, uh, so don't uh, and it's just an artificial cutoff. But uh, the point here is that the older lavas, uh, older than 14 million years, this is the flood basalt era, uh, are quite fractionated. The majority of them range down to lower magnesium concentrations and plot down in this region. Whereas with time, uh, as the volcanism is younging, uh, it's becoming more and more primitive with time, probably reflecting the fact that this extensive volcanism is, is completely reprocessing this crust and changing its ability to act as a density filter for primitive uh, magmas from the mantle. Uh, the fact that these, these uh, brown points plot up here is no surprise because they're defined as primitive magmas. But you see here uh, an interesting feature. Newberry uh, is sitting here. It has many uh, primitive basalts in it, but it also has this more extensive fractionation, which is uh, relatively unusual for high lava plains uh, rocks of this uh, young age. So we've talked about the possibility that subduction's involved here. It's unquestionably involved. Uh, there's very strong uh, signatures of, of subduction in, in various, I showed you the major element signal in the calc alkaline differentiation. Here's a very typical uh, arc signal in trace element uh, geochemistry. There's a high ion lithophile element. Barium is very soluble in slab fluids, a ratio to niobium, a high field strength element that's not soluble in flab, slab fluids. I'll get this out, slab fluids. Uh, so bear, uh, uh, slab fluids should be, lie out here at very high barium niobium ratios. Uh, this, again, is one of the beauties of, of the databases. You see Hawaii here. It's, it's basically pinned against the y-axis here. So there's no variation in barium niobium and an oceanic hotspot uh, uh, like Hawaii, at least in comparison to this kind of scale here. What you do see, though, is on the high lava plains, there's quite a range in barium niobium ratio. Some of this is due to fractionation, but most of it is not. So these, these sort of offsets to barium niobiums of 50 or so are, in fact, a signal of, of a subduction a component background in this. We'll look at that in more detail in some slides uh, in the future here. This is uh, uh, one group of the Newberry samples, a plot here at very low barium niobium ratios, so they have little uh, a very small subduction signal, but these other ones that show the low, the high, or sorry, the low iron concentrations, the calc alkaline differentiation, plot up here to high barium niobium ratios. Again, a signal that these are probably being affected by a contribution from slab fluids. Then there's also these these primitive uh, HAOTs. This is a uh, term coined by my colleague in this for many decades now, Bill Hart, high aluminum olivine tholeites. These represent uh, the primitive magmas across high lava plains. And you see that even these range out to very high barium niobium ratios. So there are these uh, uh, archy signatures that, that extend across the high lava plains. What do they look like in, in broader incompatible element diagrams? So this is the same iron versus barium niobium plot that we saw. If you look at these ones that plot at low barium niobium, they have not quite morbish, but uh, you know, relatively shallowly sloped uh, patterns, mostly smooth. There are some uh, spikes here in strontium and in barium. So even these, these sort of uninfluenced uh, magmas still have a little bit of a subduction signal in these enhancements in barium and, and strontium. If you look at the ones that with higher barium niobium, like the uh, calc alkaline uh, rocks from Newberry, you see these, these whoppingly arky uh, uh, patterns here. Very strong depletions in high field strength elements, titanium, niobium, uh, tantalum, strong enrichments in barium and, and strontium. Uh, and also in the high lava plains here, you see these, these uh, signals that look like uh, that, you know, these are not melts of a, of a normal uh, oceanic type mantle. They're very strongly influenced by some sort of a uh, component derived by the subduction. 
The other indicator of that subduction component is uh, particularly expressed in lead isotopes. Uh, it's always good there's so much lead in sediment that you subduct that even a whiff of it will overwhelm the lead isotopic composition. So here's Hawaii. Here, this is one of the few times you'll see a lot of Juan de Fuca points falling along the northern hemisphere regression line. You see pretty much all the high lava plains lavas, even uh, the primitive magmas that I've uh, separated out here, trend off the northern hemisphere regression line into this field for uh, Pacific Northwest uh, offshore sediments. This was measured by Stan Church uh, many, many years ago. So the lead uh, in these lavas is pretty much dominated by a, a subduction component. Where is this distributed spatially? So here's a map of the uh, Oregon with the uh, samples coded according to barium niobium ratios, the reds being very strong subduction component, the blues being uh, less or, or none. You see, of course, that uh, there's a very strong signal of the subduction component out here in the west uh, towards the Cascades. There's no surprise there. But you also see it scattered in here throughout the high lava plains. Most of the high lava plains has these lower barium niobium ratios, but pretty much throughout the high lava plains, even in primitive magmas, you have uh, higher barium niobium ratios. Okay, so that's a geochemical story. A part of the, uh, and you know, this is one of those things that uh, I hate to admit, but I've been working on a large part of my career and that's as far as we've gotten with it. So we, we sort of hit the wall and one of the uh, opportunities that came up uh, was to uh, include a geophysical component to actually compare these sort of signals in the surface activity with what's going on in the mantle underlying this area. So uh, as part of this high lava plains experiment, there are two uh, very large uh, seismic components to it. One is a deployment of, of passive broadband uh, systems, and this is a real joy for me. Uh, I've been giving uh, sort of advertising presentations as a project, partly just to sell it as a, as a CD project and, and, and uh, for other reasons. Uh, and I've always shown this slide and all the stars on it were where we were going to put seismometers. This is where we put seismometers. So all the blue stars on this diagram are actually seismometers. They're sitting probably under several inches of snow right now uh, in eastern Oregon recording uh, seismic waves as, as, as we're sitting here talking. So the blue stars are our deployment. The uh, green triangles here are the US array deployment, which figure heavily into the tomographic reconstructions. This is all managed by, by David James, a colleague at DTM, and Matt Fouch at ASU. Uh, the other, uh, there's uh, a lot of the results are now starting to come available from this, and there'll be several presentations here on, on Friday about uh, these results. The other thing that's shown here, these little white dots, these are, there's 15 of them on this figure, and these represent the sites where we set up uh, very large amounts of explosive material in the underground, and we recorded those with 2,600 seismometers that this crew of people deployed across eastern Oregon over one week in September. This, this I, I, you know, I'm a geochemist, so I don't do these kind of things, but I was out along with this crew, and so wa watching 60 people disperse every morning from the, the collection point was, was quite an event. We also raised the stock interests of, I, this would be insider trading if I said it before, but uh, there's a tire company in this area called Les Schwab. If you're from the Pacific Northwest, you know them really well. And I think we raised their stock tremendously by the number of uh, flat tires that we had repaired during this experiment. Uh, so we went out uh, and distributed 2,600 seismometers along this line. This was directed by Randy Keller and Steve Harder. Uh, there's, uh, as I said, it's just started in September, so we don't really have a lot of results to show. But some of those are being shown today, and there was a talk on, on this project yesterday as well. I will show you some of the tomographic results from the broadband experiment. Uh, these are going to be uh, depth slices across the area. It's a combination of our own data from the High Lava Plains experiment and the uh, US array stations. Uh, as usual, uh, these uh, are color coded. Blue is uh, fast seismic velocities or cold mantle, and red are low seismic velocities or, or, fast, uh, or uh, hot mantle. You see here the blues we'll start with. We've imaged the uh, subducting slab very well, so that's the Juan de Fuca slab. This is a depth of 50 kilometers. The Juan de Fuca slab is out here. And you also see the blue areas out here, which uh, actually do a reasonable job of, of, of falling where they're supposed to based on the 706 line, which sort of turns up here and then runs down in this area. So this is the cold uh, keel to Precambry, North America. It's not very deep at this, but 50 kilometers here. But this is very distinct from what you see in the high lava plains. The most outstanding feature in the low velocities on these figures are the Snake River plains. You see it's not a point source, it's a very long, uh, uh, source of very low seismic velocities, and depending on how you squint, and you can actually see that it extends all the way back to the coast here uh, at an inter interesting point, which is the southern margin of the Juan de Fuca slab down here at the Mendocino Fracture Zone. So there's an interesting possibility that, that this might not be a hot spot trace, but what it represents at depth really is the edge of the subducting Juan de Fuca plate. That's complete conjecture at this stage, so I'll leave it at that, but, but it's an interesting uh, thing to think about. 
Uh, what you see at this depth slice, the 50 kilometer depth slice, is that there is a good correlation with surface geology. These circles are three of the, the recent volcanic centers in the area, Newberry, Diamond Crater, and Jordan Crater. These are all thousands or tens of thousands of years old uh, volcanism. Uh, you see that there's nice little red spots directly under it. You see a liniment that you could imagine is the high lava plains volcanic trace. So uh, there's a fairly good correlation at these kind of depths uh, with surface geology. This continues, this correlation continues down to depths of 100. It begins to fade at about 150 kilometers. And then by the time you get to this 200 kilometer slice here, it's basically gone. Uh, you see here, again, the slab is imaged. In this, this case, uh, because of the dip of the slab, it's now uh, moved directly beneath Newberry here. There's this funny low velocity zone that I, I would like to ignore, but I know somebody's going to ask me what it's about. We have no idea what it's about. It, it stays with the slab, uh, in, it, or in relation to the slab, it's always just east of the slab as the slab descends. It's a very pronounced anomaly. It's not associated with any particular anomalous volcanic feature in the crust, so we just don't know what that is. Uh, but you see here in the high lava plains, that uh, the, the slow velocities are basically gone. There's no association of these kind of depths. The Snake River Plain, on the other hand, uh, continues to be this long linear trend of very low velocities across this area. As you go deeper, uh, we'll look at just two more slices here. Uh, you see, at these depths, you're basically in, into what looks to me like noise. Uh, I don't see any correlation between surface geology. I think you'd be hard pressed to find the Snake River Plain in, the, in this type of a uh, of an image. Uh, there is some remnant of low velocity under, under the Yellowstone area, but at this depth, this is, this is kind of the minimal expression of it. But it turns out this low velocity point here grows with depth again. So at about 600 kilometers, it becomes very prominent, and by the time you get down to 700 to about 900 kilometers, which is as, as deep as our images go at the moment, you have this very pronounced low velocity anomaly under, uh, more or less under Yellowstone. So if you want to uh, believe in a Yellowstone plume, this might be uh, the first imaging of it uh, in the lower mantle. Uh, but the point here, at least for the high lava plains, is that the correlation between tomography and surface geology goes away uh, within 200 kilometers of, of the surface. So trying to put these kind of tomographic models in with the, the geochemistry and the volcanic record has been the, the work of uh, uh, Chris Kincaid and Kelsey Drunken. There's a couple of animations that they're kind enough to send me. These are tank models done in corn syrup. Uh, but they're scaled, uh, and some of the, the special aspects of them are designed to mimic features of the high lava plains. We'll look first uh, at this one. This is a model where the plume model, uh, there's a slab going down here. Look, the slab is going down here. Uh, these are all referenced to uh, the slab, so the camera stays with the slab. What these are tracking in these models is the model is the slab is actually migrating out to the west, if you will. So the slab in the geological analog would be migrating to the west. Because the camera is fixed on the slab, what it looks like is that North America is migrating to the east here. So keep, keep that in mind. It's just a reference frame perspective. In this image, uh, you see that the plume is coming up. It's being introduced by a tab. You're starting subduction down here. The plume flow uh, is being very strongly affected by this corner flow. And this has some very interesting results. So here you're starting the plume. This is coming up. These are just markers within the plume. It's forming a buoyant head. It's going to hit the lithosphere, which is a lucite plate here. Hits the lithosphere. The subduction system starts. You see this is dragged uh, up into the corner flow. So one part of the plume head gets dragged up this way. The rest of the plume is moving off to the east here in the direction of plate motion. North America is basically moving this way across the screen if this weren't filmed in, in the reference frame of the slab. So uh, a nice aspect of these kind of models is that you can stick thermistors in this all over the place. So from the temperature field in this, and if you assign a, 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 you know, an a, um, excess temperature to this plume material, you can calculate how much melt will be generated by this activity and where it's going to occur. Uh, what you see, that's shown here, this is work from Chris Kincaid, is this first plume arriving here uh, melts quite considerably, so you have very high melt fractions. If you just uh, take this model and center this under the Columbia River basalts, uh, what you see is that there, uh, at least in these models, the southern edge of the slab actually draws this material not only towards the slab, but down to the south. So the, the plume head impacts here, but the plume tail is dragged down in this direction. And then as North America is moving over it, it's dragged down here, and then it begins to, to move or, or track the, the uh, position of North America. So there's continuing plume tail activity or melting down here that is migrating in the direction of plate motion, as you would expect for a hot spot with a plate moving over it. Uh, the melt volumes are smaller, uh, certainly much smaller than this, but they're, they're uh, quite significant. And this could be an explanation for the Snake River Plain Trace, for example. 
There's also the plume head trace, which you'll see here, you can keep watching these. These get sucked into this wedge flow. So this plume head that arrives here gets sucked down as, as well, and then it eventually migrates out uh, towards the, the subducting slab out here. So you can get a uh, trench direction migration, and this material is, uh, is hot. It depends on how much you deplete it in this melting event, but you can produce a stage of melting that migrates out in this way. So in this type of model of a plume influenced by wedge flow, uh, you can create the sort of, of melting patterns both in time and space that you see in the high lava plains. But what, you know, is that the answer? Uh, the other approach that you can do is, is the model down here, which is a much simpler model. You've got a thick lithosphere here, this lucite plate, a very thin lithosphere that's representing the high lava plains in this, and you're subducting this slab down and allowing it to retreat. Again, this is in the uh, reference frame of the slab. So what I've sketched over here is, is a, a cartoon of that. Uh, I think it's probably not dark enough in this room to actually see what's going on. But if you look at this in various time sizes, you see what would be normal uh, return flow if this thick root weren't here would be very dispersed flow that moves towards the trench and then goes down with the corner flow. And you get a very broad convection cell with mostly horizontal flow in the, in the upper mantle. So no expectation that this would really drive volcanism other than the volcanism that's caused by the release of fluids directly from the slab. When you put in a thick root like this, so this, this compresses the, this uh, return flow, so there can't, this is a rigid root. I mean, it's a loose, loose like plate in this diagram, so it's not moving. Uh, but it compresses the return flow so that you get very strong ascent, ascending flow right along this border. Uh, and this, of course, uh, will instigate melting if it's, um, if it's hot enough. The other thing is you have basically a short return flow here so that you get very quick cycling of this material that's right off the top of the slab. So this would be one way to uh, get a subduction component into this area. So it doesn't have to be directly from the arc in, in our conventional model for an arc, but it's basically short cycling a, a back arc uh, convective cell here. The other thing that this produces that's interesting that we can compare with our seismic results is that because the, the horizontal flow is very strongly restricted just this area be beneath the shallow slab, you get very strong and very oriented flow uh, in this region trend, towards the trench that's going to strongly uh, strong, cause strong anisotropy in the uh, mantle in that area. And in fact, that's exactly what we see. This is uh, Maureen Long's uh, data. She'll be giving this in a poster on Friday. Uh, here is shear wave splitting results for uh, all of the high lava plane seismometers. These are uh, the bars. If you're not familiar with these, the bars show the uh, splitting directions. So this is the uh, axis of fast splitting. Anyway, it's the axis of anisotropy in the mantle. You shouldn't ask geochemists to give seismology talks. Um, so you have this, th these uh, axes are aligned uh, pretty much east-west on these diagrams, which is interesting because if you look at the general distribution of anisotropy and shear wave splitting around the high lava plains in the north, uh, northwestern U.S., what you see generally are plate motion directions, which are more this northeast-southwest motion. So the uh, poles orient more towards an east-west flow here, and I think most importantly is the magnitude of the splitting increases. So the red uh, dots here are all uh, splitting signals that are more than two seconds of splitting. So this is a histogram for you of, of the histogram is the splitting results from the high lava plains. A normal split in a continental uh, area would be about a second. You're seeing two seconds of splitting in, uh, uh, in the high lava plains. So this is a very strongly sheared mantle. Uh, there's simply not enough lithosphere in this area uh, to cause this kind of a signal in the lithosphere, so this has to be tracking a senospheric flow below the area. So this is a very strong uh, trenchward migrating uh, flow uh, that's oriented east-west east in the, these uh, data. So if I can summarize all that up, uh, what we've got here is the high lava plains magnet magnetism does show strong regional uh, isotopic and temporal trends. Uh, it's clear that the lithosphere is playing an important role in this uh, magnetism. Uh, it rain, that role ranges from a contaminant, perhaps, uh, perhaps to the source of magma. But I think most importantly in dictating where the vulcan vulcanicity occurs, where the volcanoes are actually occurring, is that the lithosphere is strongly oriented, uh, a flow that's pretty much determined by the subduction system, but very strongly modified by the structure of the lithosphere to the east of that subduction system. Uh, most of the, the high lava plains basalts show at least some component, uh, some chemical component of a subduction signal. Uh, this is not at unexpected really for the westernmost ones, which are just east of the Cascades. I think it's less expected to those uh, further to the east. And one wet mechanism to get this uh, uh, pervasive uh, subduction component into this area is this sort of uh, short cycled uh, wedge flow caused by the, the lithospheric topography. Uh, we see that uh, from the tomography that the volcanism in the high lava plains really seems to be a shallow mantle feature. It or only correlates with mantle tomography down to about 100 to 150 kilometers. It's not something that's being driven by deep mantle flow. Uh, with the geodynamic modeling that I just showed you, 
You can uh, put a plume in, in, into these kind of models, but e if you do put a plume in, the plume is very clearly going to be uh, in, uh, affected by the wedge flow or the, the shallow mantle flow induced by, by the subduction system. Uh, that can produce some very interesting features, caught, uh, explaining things like why the Columbia River basalts erupted north of where the Snake River Plain uh, trace starts. Uh, it can explain these, these bifurcating, uh, uh, temporally migrating volcanic trends, one up the Snake River Plain, one up the other direction out the high lava plains. Uh, the important issue about that, though, is it, it uh, results in uh, seismic anisotropy that's not seen in these results. Uh, the anisotropy is a better fit to this, this sort of a, a lithospheric structure controlled uh, wedge flow model. Uh, the other thing is that the high lava plains basalts don't carry much of a plume geochemical signal. Uh, so uh, at the moment, anyway, it uh, looks like, uh, at least my interpretation of it, is that the high lava plains volcanism uh, is in essence a back arc flow, but it's, uh, uh, it's related and instigated primarily by uh, the up flow in the upper mantle that's induced by the, this uh, subduction system and very much modified by the structure of the lithosphere of, of North America. So thanks very much. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I will repeat the question. Uh, there are two flood basalt components in this area. Uh, the well-known Columbia River blood flood basalts, which are primarily erupted in a dike system that's on the Oregon, Idaho, Washington border. This won't mean much to, to those who are not, not familiar with western U.S. states, but uh, it's to the north of the high lava plains. Uh, and then there's another flood basalt that's about a third the size of uh, the Columbia River basalt. It's called the Steens basalt that covers most of the high lava plains. And it was erupted from dikes that are near the, the proposed arrival spot of the, if you extend the Snake River Plain to the west, uh, Steens is not far from that. So uh, mapping of it shows that the activity actually started at Steens and migrated to the north. Uh, I think that's indisputable. The issues I have with it is that the migration rates are incredibly fast uh, because, it, I mean, the age dating of this shows Steens and the oldest Columbia River basalts are indistinguishably the same age for Argon Argon, which is not an uncommon problem with flood basalts. Uh, but if you look at it, the, the Steens inter, interfingers with the Amnaha, which is the oldest unit in the Columbia River basalts. So this is happening uh, uh, at rates that are not, uh, not achievable in mantle flow, I think. So this is uh, maybe dike propagation in the lithosphere. It may be a completely separate system. Uh, it may be because uh, in these, these models where you have this ascending flow along the lithosphere boundary, you're going to have a line of volcanism rather than a, a, a point source of volcanism. And, that may just be the way it became a line as it started at Steens and migrated to the north, and it was, you know, it was being driven by this uh, ascending flow along the 706 line, the thick lithosphere to the east. Never. Never. Uh, it's always west of it. Uh, one, of the, one of the options is uh, that it, it actually represents a tear in the slab, and, it, and it's a sort of a hot portion of mantle coming through that. Uh, if, I, I didn't show it, but if, if you notice those diagrams, there's a, associated with it, there's a sort of a gap in the trench on that side. I don't know if we can get there. Uh, there's, there's a part where the deep blue turns light blue. Uh, the trouble with this is, is that uh, that's almost certainly an artifact of the tomographic inversion, according to my seismic colleagues. When you have that strong a low-velocity anomaly there, if you, if you actually impose a, a high-velocity slab right in that area, it's going to return as a, as a relatively low-velocity feature. So it, the controlling feature in that, especially the 200 thing, 200 kilometer depth slice, is the low-velocity feature. And I don't think you can confidently interpret the... the uh, weakening of the slab signal to the to the west of that. So I frankly we don't have a clue what this is. <laughs> yeah, there's another question. Do you think that the uh inferred flow in the atmosphere is coupled to the overlying lithosphere and affects uh surface tectonics? Um 
Well, what the, one of the strong features that's inducing that flow is that in, in Chris's tank models, the slab is, is basically retreating to the west, if, if you want to think about it that way. So the reason that that flow is so enhanced is because of the trench, trench migration, if you will. Uh, and then the horizontal flow is focused at a very shallow level uh, by this, this thin region that it has to flow being constrained on the east by the thicker lithosphere. Uh, you would think that that might accelerate extension rates in this area if it's driving plate tectonic motion in a back arc or something like this. I assume that that's the point of your question. Uh, the extension rates in this area, I, I've long been of the feeling that there is no basement un under the high lava plains in this area is, is extended completely. Uh, there's no evidence in support of that whatsoever. <laughs> uh, uh, there are GPS uh, systems out in this area that are showing uh, zero or very, very uh, small extension rates today. Uh, so it's not actively extending. Uh, if you do fault uh, extension rates uh, summing to see what the extension rates have been, you get low values. If you do paleomag on the coast, you get relatively low values. There is an issue with measuring extension in a volcanic terrain like this, and you can see it in the Snake River Plain very clearly, is that the extension is not taken up by faulting, it's taken up by dike injection of magnetism. So it's possible that we're underestimating the amount of extension in the high lava plains, but there's very little evidence that, that shows that to be the case. One more question? Okay, well, uh, oh, there's one question at the back, yeah. Could, uh, could you speak to the uh, possibility that the arc signature across the region is uh, a feature of the uh, free strain hemisphere? Yes, uh, I mean, th this is a, basically a fossil slab signal. The, uh, Subduction, of course, has been a, I'm, I'm sorry, there's a spotlight that's trained right in my eyes over your head, but uh, uh, subduction in this area has been prominent for a very long time, uh, and it's, there are uh, models where it was flat slab subduction causing volcanism well to the east in about 50 million years ago or so. So it's not at all impossible that this whole area was uh, sort of swamped by slab fluids by that prehistory of subduction. Uh, I, in various papers, have, have been on the, the side of that being a fossil slab signal. The thing that troubles me about that in, in, with the current data set is that what you can see in this is there's very clearly a, a, a maturation of the lithosphere in this area so that during the flood basalt area, it really looks like you cooked the lithosphere. And I, I would think you'd have a hard time preserving a, a pre-flood basalt signal in that lithosphere. And where we're seeing this, and some of these high barium niobium ratios to the east are occurring in, in very young, very primitive magmas uh, that look like they're melting in the mantle. So it's certainly not impossible that it's being picked up as a lithospheric signal, but at the moment I'm, I'm tending to think that it's actually a component of the mantle source of, of those, uh, you know, the sublithospheric mantle source of those magmas. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed, Rick. Uh, fantastic talk. Just to quickly remind everybody, uh, 6.30 tonight in the Marriott room, um, 10.15 down below. You've got to be there by 6.30. We're going to lock the doors, and Jana Blishatov is going to handle anybody who's trying to come in. So um, please show up and show your support for your colleagues. And the beer is free and whatever else is free. So please come along and uh, enjoy it. But we're going to do the first bit first, and then the, get trashed afterwards. We just have one.